A very good evening and welcome uh, to all of our distinguished panelists and all of those who will be watching our program today to the ninth round of the Herat Security Dialogue. Uh, today's panel is on Afghanistan-Pakistan relations and the Afghan peace process. Before introducing our panelists, I'd like to talk a little bit about the synopsis of today's, um, today's topic to provide a context for our audience. Afghanistan and Pakistan share a deep historical and cultural links. But relations between the two neighboring countries have mostly remained tense since 1947, when Pakistan gained its independence. The tension is rooted in bilateral disagreements and grievances, as well as in regional rivalries. It, is hoped, it was hoped that the US-led intervention in Afghanistan in 2001 would be the start of new and beginning uh, friendlier ties and bilateral relations in, in achieving regional peace and harmony. The former Afghan president, Hamid Karzai, had described Pakistan and Afghanistan as conjoined twins and inseparable brothers. While Pakistan's authorities repeatedly gave assurances about their cooperation to rebuild an Afghanistan at peace with itself and others. How their establishment for helping and hosting militant groups fighting in Afghanistan on the other hand, Pakistan officials have accused the Afghan government of allowing various violent groups to launch attacks into Pakistan. Nevertheless, recent political and economic and security conditions in both countries have presented yet another opportunity to both states to rebuild these linkages and foster constructive and, and improve bilateral relations. The official start of talks between the Taliban in Doha and the Afghan state had set the stage for Pakistan, which, which is uniquely positioned to contribute to it. It is understood among most Afghan decision makers that Pakistan, that what Pakistan can do at this moment to bring peace in Afghanistan, no other state in the region can. Alternatively, to understand the strategic security and foreign policy choices Pakistan is facing at the time, Afghanistan has to look at the security strategic choices Pakistan is facing domestically in the shape of various crises it is contending with. There are three main crises that has the potential to shape Pakistan's orientation to Afghanistan and the region. They are characterized as fiscal and economic, public health and the shape of the impact of COVID, and the natural disasters impacting its agricultural sector. Pakistan has a plethora of problems to focus on internally, not to mention insecurity and mounting debt and ethnic disenfranchisement increasingly felt by large segments of a society, to mention a few. Thus, these conditions hold the possibility for Pakistan to focus on its very domestic crises, many of them interrelated, and thus reorient its posture of foreign defense security and policy from the region so it can play a more constructive role internally and by extension regionally. And because of Pakistan's unique position and the role it can play in the Afghan peace process, it stands to reap massive dividends from a peaceful Afghanistan that may contribute to some of its own internal crises. This is not the first time that both of these countries have found themselves at such a crossroads. We now look towards them to see if they will take stock of the opportunity and pave a new path towards improved cooperation and trust, or whether many of the mistakes repeated, many of the mistakes conducted in the past would yet again repeat themselves. To be able to take a deeper look into these issues, uh, we have today with us an extraordinary uh, panel that I have the great privilege of introducing to you all. Today's speakers include Deputy Minister Mohammad Omar Dawood Zain, who is a special envoy of Afghanistan for Pakistan. Minister Dawood Zain previously served as the Chief of Staff of President Karzai, as Ambassador to Iran and Pakistan, as the Minister of Interior Affairs and Special Envoy on Regional Affairs for Consensus on Peace. We also have with us today 
General Assad Durrani, who in 1990 headed the Inter-Services Intelligence and Post in 1993. After leaving the army, General Durrani became Pakistan's ambassador to Germany and then in Saudi Arabia. We also have with us today His Excellency, Minister Mustafa Mastur, who is the senior advisor and special representative of the chairman of Afghanistan's High Council for National Reconciliation. Minister Mastur served as the general director of budget and subsequently as deputy minister of finance at the Ministry of Finance, as well as senior advisor to the chief executive of the national unity government, and was also the minister of economy from 2017 to 2020. Also with us today is Dr. Aisha Sadiqa, who is the author of several books on Pakistan's military, namely Pakistan's Arms Procurement and Military Buildup, and Inside Pakistan's Military Economy. Currently, Dr. Sadiqa has is working on her latest book on sociology of radicalism in Pakistan and writes and publishes for several journals and academic papers. And last, but of course, certainly not least, we have with us Honorable Ms. Fazia Kofi, who is a member of the negotiation team of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Ms. Kofi served as the deputy and representative of the people of Badakhshan. ...of Afghanistan, the Mulisa Jirga. And at the present moment, I once again, Welcome you all, and we can go straight into our questions. My very first question is for Minister uh, Dawood Zai. Uh, Minister, in your view and opinion, what are some of the new challenges preventing the building of trust between Afghanistan and Pakistan? And how can both states address this trust deficit and establish what former Afghan President Hamid Karzai had called a civilized relationship? Minister Dawudzai, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Good evening, uh, Mariam Jan, uh, Durani Sahab, uh, Siddiqa Sahab, uh, Mastur Sahab, and uh, uh, Madam Kufi, if she is around. Good evening to everybody. So nice to be in this panel. Uh, Yes, uh, normally when we start talking about a subject like this, we visit history um, and then give uh, um, our description and then give our recommendations. These days I am trying to do it reverse. I try with, with a recommendation first. And my recommendation to the panel and to anywhere I speak is that uh, let's forget about the past. Let's not live in the past. Uh, let's say and, and tomorrow. Uh, in the past, we didn't have the COVID-19, uh, which we have now. And there are many other challenges that we didn't have in the past. We have it now and we may have it in the future. Now, having uh, said that, the main problem uh, between Afghanistan and Pakistan, that is the main cause of trust deficiency, it's fear. Uh, Pakistan fear that uh, uh, a stable Afghanistan may allow India to harm Pakistan's integrity. Uh, likewise, uh, Afghanistan uh, uh, help uh, uh, Islamist uh, uh, cam extremists and even in some cases terrorists to destabilize Afghanistan and uh, it starts all the way back from 1973 when the first uh, group of six Islamist leaders crossed over to Pakistan and they were uh, trained and equipped and used against President Daoud and the episode goes on until now. So at present, uh, Afghanistan's complaint or mistrust is that Pakistan uh, may be still helping Taliban. Um, at least one thing is clear that uh, most of Taliban's leaders are based in Pakistan. 
and even there are fears. This is not official. Unofficial fear is that uh, maybe Pakistan is even trying to build a replacement for Taliban. If Taliban somehow reconcile, then uh, there, there may be a replacement group for that that is already being out. So these are fears. They are, they are fears of each other. Now there are opportunities on both sides and the problems have provided opportunity to us and the global and regional geopolitical circumstances, the alliances uh, uh, that's built, that's broken, these all provided us with the challenges and with opportunities. Uh, one of the main opportunities is the rising China in its uh, uh, vast economic uh, uh, package that's offering to the countries around, particularly Pakistan and Afghanistan. The other challenge that's more immediate is that uh, COVID-19 has uh, affected the economy of both the countries. And in Pakistan, particularly the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa is more badly affected because of the closure of the borders, uh, the crossings with, uh, with Afghanistan. So we, have, we, we are starting a new uh, chapter in, in our relationship. Um, there are opportunities, like for instance, if I flag one of them that for the first time I see that in Pakistan, the army and the civil government is on the same page. We don't have to talk to, uh, to them separately and get separate messages. Uh, we get uh, same message, same language. Uh, they are on the same page. Uh, this is this is also another opportunity. On our side, also there is a, a newly developed uh, consensus. Like for instance, uh, uh, the two main uh, contesting uh, election team, uh, one headed by Dr. Rani, the other headed by Dr. Abdullah. They are now part of the same team and they're working together um, in full consensus. One is leading this, leading the peace process. So it's another opportunity that we are building on it. And because of those opportunities, unprecedented things happened in the past. We were witness to that, like a visit of Dr. Abdullah with invitation from Prime Minister Imran Khan and the way the protocol he was offered uh, this was unprecedented uh, in the uh, recent history of the country, at least in the past uh, 20 years. Uh, and uh, um, very soon there would be more senior visits. Uh, they, they, we had a visit of uh, our head of parliament uh, with a big delegation. Uh, this was, I think, the largest delegation has ever uh, visited uh, Islamabad. And uh, there was this uh, conference uh, for improvement of technology, which again, uh, exceptionally, it was hosted by Asad Qaisar, the, um, the Speaker of Pakistani Parliament. Pakistan unilaterally introduced a very liberal um, visa policy for, for Afghans. Um, in the very near future, uh, a senior Pakistani delegation headed by Razak Dawood uh, the right hand of Prime Minister Imran Khan will be visiting uh, Kabul. And that would be, be followed by visit of Prime Minister Imran Khan and then uh, yeah. President Ghani. Now, the change from our side, the change of thinking and the change of approach from our side is that in the past uh, 19 years, uh, we were specifically asking Pakistan to help us with the peace process. Like, for instance, uh, we would demand um, th that they should uh, force Taliban leaders to come to negotiating table and talk to us. Um, that never worked. Now we have changed the whole concept. We have identified uh, six areas of cooperation. Uh, out of that six areas of cooperation, one is in respect to Pakistan's cooperation with the peace process. And we are not uh, claiming in that way, like force Taliban to come to the negotiating table. Our language now is that uh, we are grateful that you helped the US Taliban talks and uh, you facilitated the Taliban's presence in Doha. 
And we expect you as one of the six objectives that we have both decided and agreed upon to also facilitate um, Afghan to Afghan talks. Well, Mariam John, I can go on. I don't know how much time do I have. Maybe I take other people's time. I should stop here in case there, is, there are areas of interest that I should expand. Yes, thank you very much, Minister Dawitsai. I, uh, I appreciate you considering our time limitation. Um, I would like to now uh, move on to, uh, to, to General uh, Durrani. Um, General Durrani, as, as Minister Dawitsai uh, just uh, mentioned, that one of the factors that has led to this uh, deficit in trust has been fear much linked to the regional rivalries that have uh, that have ensued this region and notions of proxies that have taken place and my question to you uh, General Durrani is how are regional rivalries continuing to impact the relationship between the countries meaning where do they currently stand right now as of today let's say and how can we both delink uh, their bilateral relations? How can we delink the, the bilateral uh, the the bilateral relations of both of these states, Afghanistan and Pakistan, from these regional rivalries? General Durrani, the floor is yours. Regional life rivalries very little to do with Pakistan relations. If we believe that this is the type of relationship we have, sometimes calling it conjoint twins and sometimes, you know, inevitably in intertwined and interdependent, then it's not because of our relations with either Iran or with India or China. It would make any difference. The problem is that its relation is not only about Islamabad and Kabul. There are so many different factions in Afghanistan and so are there. Our tribal areas have a particular relationship with Afghanistan. When Afghanistan comes under stress, let's say it gets invaded by the Soviet Union or by the United States, then there is another polarization that takes place in Afghanistan. There are resistors and there are collaborators. Generally, I mean, Mr. Dalza would remember that essentially the people in Pakistan are always on the side of those people who are resisting a foreign invasion or foreign occupation for the simple reason. There are many other reasons, but the main reason is, and that is where I'm going to differ very, very vehemently with Mr. Larson. A stable Afghanistan, an independent Afghanistan, is the one that serves our interests the most. Remember 65 war? Remember 71 war? I'm a veteran of both of these. And since Afghanistan, Kabul could take its own decisions independently, we removed all our forces to the Eastern Front and the Afghans took after our Western Fronts. But when there is a polarization within Afghanistan, then we have a problem. Should we be now going for some sort of a regime in Kabul, which has been, been installed by a foreign power? Or should we go for the people who are fighting uh, you know, the foreign relation, fighting for the liber liberation of Afghanistan? Because ultimately, we know the history. Ultimately, we are the ones who prevail. And that is a big decision that one has to take. And that is what brings us to that very, very crucial balancing game that we have to do. There is a Government in Afghanistan, one has to have a relationship with that, whether it is Najibullah or whether it is now Ashrafani. But there are also a large number of people who are uh, involved in resistance. What do we do? They have a sympathy, in, a large sympathy in our part of the world. We also have to keep them in some sort of a, you know, contact or good humor. And knowing ultimately that we all have to live here, there is no way that we are going to cut off our relation context with any of the Afghan factions. And that is where, you know, one comes up and says, there is no trust between Kabul and Islamabad. There would be trust between Kabul and Islamabad, provided 
both the countries can represent the whole, uh, not both the governments can represent the whole country. So India influence comes as a rationalization for a certain thing. I have dealt with this. We never thought that Indians influence was anywhere close to what we could not manage. Our influence was much more, our history, our neighborhood, uh, the neighborhood. And so India was not a big player. In fact, one did not even care for so many things that the Indians would do during the Soviet invasion, for example. Later on, whenever they were doing, during the, you know, the last 20 years, the genuine interest they can continue to pursue because that's for, good, for the good of Afghanistan. If there is something that they are, uh, you know, uh, that uh, we may not like, it's up to us to take care of that. It's got nothing to do with the Afghans. It's got nothing to do with the relationship between the two people, let me say. For the time being, I think I'll just stop here. Thank you very much, uh, General Durrani, for your insightful remarks, as always. Um, I would like to, to, to now uh, move on to our third speaker um, and ask a question of uh, Minister Masur. Uh, Minister Masur, as General Durrani just pointed out to us, that a stable and prosperous Afghanistan serves the interests of Pakistan. And if, if this is certainly, of course, the, the, the case, then the current peace process and the role that Pakistan can play in this process to bring about that stability uh, and, and that prosperity would be quite important. So we are at an opportune moment right now to be able to do this. And so my question for you, uh, Minister, is U.S. officials um, and also Afghan government officials have acknowledged Pakistan's help in the Afghan peace process. What has Pakistan done so far? Has it been enough? And can, do, and can Pakistan do more in being able to contribute to this process and how? I'm sorry, there was, a, there was, I think, four questions in my question to you, Minister Mastur. Uh, but I hand over the platform to you to hear your insights. Thank you. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you very much, uh, Mariam John. And good evening uh, to all distinguished panelists. A uh, very important question uh, and at a very important time. Uh, colleagues, uh, uh, all of us, no, there's no doubt that uh, Pakistan had, has had a good relationship with Taliban since they were formed. Uh, Pakistan uh, was the first and one of the three countries that recognized Taliban in 1995. And also no doubt that this relationship and support has been maintained since then in many forms, whether it was political, economic, religious, etc. And because of that, Pakistan has always kept this leverage and influence on Taliban too. This leverage is needed more than ever now to convince the Taliban that the war in Afghanistan has no winner. Uh, in the visit uh, that Dr. Abdullah had to Islamabad in September, uh, I have uh, heard this message uh, uh, just uh, 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 in every meeting that we had there, the message that we heard was that no military solution for the current problems in Afghanistan. The way forward is only a political settlement. Uh, hearing this from Pakistan, uh, highest uh, level of civilian and military uh, officials is always uh, uh, a good thing. But no one can deny that Pakistan and Karen, uh, as you said, that what Talib, uh, Pakistan has already done. No one can deny that Pakistan has encouraged Taliban to join the dialogue and the negotiation process, uh, including Moscow and many other uh, places. Also, Pakistan closely engaged with U.S. Uh, during the U.S.-Taliban negotiations. Ambassador Khalil Zad has uh, had frequently uh, visits to Pakistan, including the one last week. Uh, so when we talk about Pakistan-Taliban relationship, we mainly uh, mean military setup. Uh, that makes uh, that make most of the policies uh, in this regard. 
for sure, other institutions in Pakistan are also there, but certainly follow them. Uh, but whether Pakistan do more or should do more, uh, my answer to this is yes, for many reasons. Political, whether it is polit be political, economical, or security. Uh, I, I want to express my points uh, for this question in three main areas. Uh, as a fact, as a challenge, and as an opportunity. That how Pakistan can play a direct and or indirect role to help the Afghan peace process. Uh, the first one, I'm coming to fact, the design of Pakistan-Taliban relationship. A fact that we usually missed so far. One very important feature of Pakistan-Taliban relationship is the design of it. That should always be taken into consideration. Pakistan has always maintained direct, uh, I'm uh, putting uh, emphasis here, direct, but separate connections with both Taliban leaders and their local commanders. So there were direct connections with leaders and also direct connections with commanders in the field. This approach has always given Pakistan a leverage when they need it. It was similar during Mujahideen time as well. I'm sure uh, Durrani said uh, well remember it. The local commanders were always left to be autonomous particularly in finding their financial resources, manpower, and most of their operations. Uh, however, the major support they were getting from their leaders was only political and media backup. Almost all of their local commanders get their financing from either narcotics, mining, taxing people, and turning the whole uh, thing into a business for themselves. Unfortunately, this level of independence between Taliban leaders and fighters in the field makes the peace process difficult. This is really a fact. So dealing with this fact is very important for the success of the process. And this is why Taliban in Doha could not agree so far to the reduction of violence, because they will not be able to keep such promises in the field for the mentioned reason. My view is that partial ceasefires, particularly during E days, were needed and decided by both. Because of that, the peace for Taliban in Doha does not mean the same for the Taliban in the field. For many of them, uh, it means just shutting the door of their businesses. This was the fact that we missed so far. This is a fact, and unless we don't deal with it, the negotiations in Doha may not succeed uh, to end the fighting uh, with Taliban. There might be a deal, but it may not be the end of the war. And this is a very important area that I think uh, uh, Pakistan can deliver more in this area too. Colleagues, another link to this fact is that we have witnessed that those Taliban key figures who joined the process and now for years they're staying in Kabul lost their local supports because of their commanders and foot soldiers continued the fighting uh, through someone else. Another clear example was Mr. Hikmatyar. He and his close members of uh, the team uh, are enjoying Kabul while almost all of his previous fighters are now with the Taliban. So the main issue for now is the same. How we could make the peace deal in Doha when there is one, the end of war with the Taliban in the field. For a durable peace, the political process is as important as a realistic reintegration programs for the foot soldiers in the field, and we shouldn't miss it. So that they are confident that they have regular income post peace. Otherwise, they will continue with another group. A meaningful debate about it, preferably through, through private sector, may be crucial. While political settlement process may be well handled by the governments, for the economic reintegration, we could engage the private sectors of both countries as well. Now coming to the second point, which is challenges. A big challenge for, uh, that I see now, it is over recognition of Taliban in the last two years. The unnecessary over-recognition of Taliban by everyone has created an overconfidence within them. The back-to-back -back dialogues, trips, including several capitals, senior level visits to Doha, the Taliban and the US agreement, the 5,000 president release, and the sense of urgency and withdrawal of the President Trump uh, by President Trump, all could be the reasons for this overconfidence. The rigidity, the rigidity of the Taliban for the start of the negotiations, despite many direct calls and even some critical statements by allies clearly indicate their level of self-confidence or over-optimism uh, for U.S. faster withdrawal. 
probably Taliban expected a different result in the US election, but now is the time for being more realistic. Pakistan can play a significant role here too, uh, though I heard that the recent meeting of Mr. Faiz Hamid, uh, DGI side with Taliban in Doha, was not a very productive one. Coming to the opportunity, the regional consensus on peace is a big opportunity. So far, the peace diplomacy was handled only by US, mainly by Ambassador Khalilzad. But as all call for Afghan-led and Afghan-owned peace process, and some even adds Afghan-controlled, a strong regional peace diplomacy by an Afghan, a senior Afghan, someone heavily engaged in peace and has the skill was highly needed. This was why this was to augment Zal's efforts in this process and to directly engage the leadership of the immediate as well as extended neighbors to get their views, listen to their concerns and to accommodate them in the process and seek their genuine support to the process. This was needed. Dr. Abdullah, uh, as the current chairman of the HCNR and having personal relationship with almost all of these politicians in the region and as a former Minister of Foreign Affairs was the one with a unique position to lead this regional diplomacy in favor of the Afghan peace process. He started his regional peace diplomacy from Pakistan. Then he was to Iran, uh, to India and Iran. And just an hour ago, he left to Uzbekistan. Turkey is the next country in his list and all other countries in the region and beyond is part of his post Geneva plans. Coming to Pakistan and his role, the recent visit of Dr. Abdullah to Pakistan, as Minister Dauze was saying, was a very important and helpful one. My general impression from this trip is that there was a strong eagerness for peace in Afghanistan and also its dividends. I felt uh, there a strong desire for improvement of bilateral relationship and maximizing the economic opportunities that peace could bring. Friends, I still see the glass as half full when it comes to the peace process and our relationship with Pakistan. Our people deserve better lives and we have great potentials to become prosperous nations. No doubt that a peaceful Afghanistan will be in the interest and benefit of the region as well. And to conclude my points, the window to bring peace in Afghanistan is open. We need to make the best use of this opportunity. Thank you. Minister Mr. thank you very much uh, for your remarks. And uh, at this juncture of our panel, uh, one of the greatest benefits of being a moderator is that I can get to ask uh, some of my uh, very initial uh, uh, questions. Um, when we are, uh, when we have asked our final question from our final um, speaker, then I will uh, share a series of two questions um, uh, uh, for each of the panelists. Uh, and then towards the end, we will have a chance for all of the panelists to provide their final remarks. Um, Dr. Aisha Siddiqui, um, as Minister Mastur highlighted some of these very hard facts to us, um, this brings me to, to, to ask you, um, is Pakistan reorienting itself uh, to focus not only on the existential crisis that it is facing internally, but also on the dividends it stands to reap from playing its unique role in the Afghan peace process? So Dr. Siddiqui, I wanted to hand over the floor to you uh, to uh, provide your remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Marion Safi, um, for these questions and for this invite. Um, is Pakistan reorienting itself? Um, the question is, why does Pakistan have to reorient its policies? Um, I mean, you talk about existential threat, which I find an amusing concept because that existential threat, I mean, if you're referring to economy, struggle within, uh, you know, domestic politics, that is something which Pakistan has been facing for a very long time. Um, when is it that we've not had this, Pakistan has not had this crisis, politics and, and, uh, and, and bad ec ec economics? So Pakistan has historically, it has grown economically, then, you know, because there, there have not been those structural adjustments and therefore it, it, it has gone down. So 
those things continue. Now, on the other hand, I find it um, both interesting and, and amusing as well that, uh, you know, the, the Afghan interlocutors find it much more comfortable seeing civil and military on the same page. Uh, but perhaps there's another way of looking at uh, this particular design that when civil and military were not on the same page, uh, there were perhaps a little more space for, for the Afghans. Uh, there was a disagreement. The civilians didn't want, uh, you know, not all of them didn't want, uh, you know, to pursue relations with Afghanistan in a certain way. Uh, there has been this debate internally of, you know, uh, of, of, you know, either holding on to Afghanistan or letting it go. So that has, you know, that has continued. Um, but the complexities in, in policies are still there. Um, you know, you would, you would talk about listening to this discussion about the Taliban, and, and we often also forget that within Pakistan itself, there is a player that we uh, kind of don't mention, the militant groups that are within. I mean, I was recently reading comments by... Uh, Masood Azhar, uh, leader of jesh e Muhammad, talking about how Afghanistan is uh, the heartland of jihad, of, of Islamic jihad. And uh, basically his, uh, you know, very convoluted, but, but uh, you know, message within message was that this is something which will continue. So the support is there. And these uh, elements are kind of, they have an influence on, on, on policy. I mean, they provide an option which is still open. Uh, so I think there isn't, there is the way Pakistan looks at it, and then this is purely from an analytical point of view. I'm not, I'm not part of, uh, you know, uh, any, any, anywhere part of the government or, or where policies are made or not privy to it. Uh, but I think uh, what I believe as, as an analyst and as, as an observer that, uh, there is a kind of an understanding that to secure Afghanistan, to secure a neighbor, a, a Northwestern neighbor for Pakistan, which doesn't necessarily kind of, uh, you know, partner with India, which doesn't create problems for Pakistan, which doesn't uh, lead to uh, or or, or to minimize a two-front war situation at, at, at any given point in time, uh, you need a government in Kabul where, uh, from Islamabad's point of view, and this is not something new that I'm saying, I think there is greater faith and comfort in having Taliban representing the Pashtun population. Um, the secular uh, Pashtuns is something which perhaps... Islamabad finds difficult to, to trust. A more religious Pashtun in the form of Taliban is much more. And having said that, I don't think that Taliban are completely under Islamabad's control. I mean, they, there is influence, no doubt about it. Yet, um, Taliban are not entirely under uh, Islamabad's control. There is give and take, there is definitely more trust, but there is also anxiety. Uh, which is perhaps one of the reasons that Pakistan recently engaged in, in conversation with Gulbuddin Hikmatyar. Uh, so it's opening up its options, uh, not necessarily shifting, but changing its options. Uh, how Pakistan and Afghanistan can benefit from each other economically, politically, socially, I mean, there is no debate about it. Uh, there is so much to gain. Uh, Yet I think the problem, the main, the core problem which stops it, uh, this, this economic benefit from materializing is geopolitics. Uh, the, especially the, the new game that is shaping up, which is China versus US and in partnership with, you know, with, with India. Uh, Pakistan feels that it needs to secure Afghanistan as a more dependable partner. And unfortunately, uh, or incidentally, uh, it sees that, uh, I mean, I, and, and I'm not even suggesting that Pakistan wants uh, 
a regime in Kabul where uh, Taliban dominated as, as they did in the 1990s. And therefore, perhaps you see a more ease in conversation in Islamabad as compared to in the past. Uh, but I think that, um, you know, that is something which primarily uh, instructs Pakistan's mind on, on where to go and how to, uh, how to move on on, on, uh, on Afghanistan. Uh, India is primarily, I mean, at one point in time, I remember it used to be said that perhaps uh, the solution of Kashmir lies in, in Afghanistan. And I would say that now, in a way, it's uh, kind of, you know, it, it, it's, it's flipped. I think the, the, any possibility of how far do you move in on, on Afghanistan lies in what kind of conversation India and Pakistan have. Uh, right now, there's no conversation happening. I mean, the the only uh, possibility of a back channel was 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 recently, uh, you know, um, uh, that was thwarted. Uh, but uh, I believe that you know some form of track to some kind of back channel has to begin between India and Pakistan, uh, especially as 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 President. Uh, elect Biden takes over and and United States comes back into business, um, more serious business of of talks and negotiations. Um, I think that's the point when somebody should explore and exploit uh, how to get India and Pakistan back to the table. Afghanistan is stuck somewhere in the middle of the two states. I hope this helps. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sideka. Um, it, it, it's, it, I, I'm not sure about um, helping, uh, but it most definitely um, uh, highlights the complexities uh, that we are dealing with, some of which have existed um, since the beginning of the relationship of, the, of these two countries. And as we can see that they've only but shifted slightly, at times taking one step forward, two steps back. Um, and it takes me back to my early point, um, um, after listening to you, of, of whether this is or is not an opportune time, or whether it is a time like every other time, and there's nothing quite different about it. Um, but to be able to delve a little bit um, uh, deeper, we unfortunately don't have that amount of uh, time in our panel, but we do have some time at this stage um, uh, to ask uh, 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 two more questions. And at this particular juncture, um, I had um, I had two quick two questions that I want to put out there for all the panelists and you can feel free to answer whichever you'd like or both. I would just request for, to keep your remarks quite short. Um, first is that uh, we talked about, Minister Mastur touched upon uh, the U.S. elections and I wanted to ask with the Biden White House, with the Democrats returning uh, into the White House, um, how do you see that shaping the uh, peace talks? One, and two, how do you think uh, this would impact Afghan and, and Pakistan relations vis-a-vis -vis the peace process in the next year, let's say? And, um, and a last question is, uh, Pakistan has fenced most of, uh, of the Duran line, which is restricting the movement uh, of people on both sides who share tribal and, of course, family ties also. And this is having a negative impact on trade and, and the economy, which has been touched upon a lot in today's panel. Uh, meanwhile, Pakistani Prime Minister recently spoke about this uh, and about his desire of having a European Union type of, of free movement uh, between the two countries. Um, the question is, how can you reconcile these two seemingly contradictory measures or, or, or statements? Um, so those are the questions, and I'd like to hand over the floor uh, to Minister Dawood Zai uh, to provide his uh, remarks. And once again, you may feel free to answer all of them or any which that you prefer. Minister Dawood Zai. Well, uh, th uh, thank you again, and I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Siddiqa for speaking so eloquently. Uh, 
I, I agree with uh, probably 99.9% of what the reality and the complexity is very, very well. Now, I wouldn't comment on the, uh, how would it shape under Biden because it's too soon. We don't know how uh, his, his team will be formed, uh, what is in his mind. Although we can do a bit of prediction uh, based on uh, his previous role as uh, vice president. Um, I was chief of staff to president at the time. And I remember that uh, he and the Obama team was very keen uh, to develop a comprehensive bilateral relationship between Afghanistan and Pakistan. And I hope he follows that line. Now here, uh, with the new uh, phase of our relationship, uh, we, we are following that line of building comprehensive relationship as two neighbors that, don't, uh, that do not fear each other that trust each other and that cooperate in all areas of concern, not limiting their relationship in terms of uh, how to deal with the militants and how to deal with extremism. Of course, that's part of it. And like I said in the beginning, that's one of the six areas that we have defined. There are other areas, this whole domain of the bilateral relationship, we are working on a roadmap for that. Uh, then. Uh, um, then uh, the management of the Durand line is another issue between us that we are working on it. And again, we are developing a roadmap for it. Um, uh, and then a refugee return. We have millions of Afghans that are settled as refugees there. We, we would like them to see them to return back to their country. And so will Pakistan. Pakistan also would like them to return back to Afghanistan uh, with dignity and honor. And then a very immediate uh, uh, area of focus for, it, for us is the whole area of uh, economic uh, cooperation. Uh, we are uh, two countries that highly depend on each other. Um, Afghanistan depends on Pakistan. Pakistan depends on Afghanistan itself. And also Pakistan is is uh, seeking uh, access to Central Asia and uh, Pakistan is seeing regional co connectivity in its uh, interest in uh, uh, regional connectivity uh, uh, roadmap. So to, to summarize, uh, what I'm trying to say is that in the past we were focusing on cooperation in the area of security and dealing with militancy and extremism. Now we are taking a step beyond that. We are trying to develop um, a comprehensive bilateral relationship uh, between the two countries uh, who can live in trust, not fear. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Yeah. Uh, General Durrani, your thoughts on these questions? I think we are overestimating the roles of two countries right now in the peace process. One is United States and the other is Pakistan. The United States has done whatever damage it used to do. It has it's passed us. It has finally created the favorable environment in which the Taliban and the Afghan, the Kabul regime and the rest of the people can get together and talk about it. So has Pakistan. You know, Pakistan has only this role that when the time is right, because I probably said that in the earlier session, all of our factions are important for us. They have to come to some sort of a, a, an agreement. The broad-based government is something that we used to talk about it. The grand bargain that created Afghanistan, all of our factions have to be sitting on the table to resolve it. And that is why our job was somehow or other to take the Taliban to the table. We did it twice before in Doha. We did it twice in, uh, uh, in Mari. And now that the environment is so right, I mean, Aisha is absolutely right. We cannot influence either side to do something. It is up to now, up to them. As far as the other part is concerned on uh, Iran line, I think there are people on my side, on Pakistani side, they make a huge mistake. They probably rationalize, you know, the problem in defining a border. 
we know this border. This border has existed right for the last 72 and even before that. It didn't create any problem. Both the sides honored that line, regardless of what it was called. It is not possible to seal that thing. We have tribes on both sides. And in any case, if we are talking about that type of a relationship, then there has to be the accommodation of not only Islamabad and Afghanistan, Kabul, but also of the tribes straddling that line. So insisting on, uh, you know, making Durand line a different type of border is disingenuous on our part. It did not have that. So we can leave that. We did not touch that. We need not even discuss that. But I know why it is done. You know, it is some sort of a rationalization. Well, I think the problem is the Durand line. It is not. On the other side, if someone in the Afghan side were to say, the problem is that Pakistan wants to have a client with you. For heaven's sake. If Afghans, I mean, we cannot even influence one particular uh, faction. I mean, I can remember my time when all these parties used to be with us. On our side, fully dependent for their living, for their fighting, and so on and so forth. But they took their own decision. So with such independent people, don't try and, you know, rub anything in because they will not be vulnerable to any pressure. So that is where people make a mistake that Pakistan wants to have a client regime. I think even a friendly regime is too much to talk about. This is something that actually people on the other side should take offense to. Who are you to determine what type of a government we'll have here? And we know, at least people like we know, that whatever government is there, if it has the support of the uh, sort of Afghans or all factions of the Afghans, they will take a decision in Afghanistan interest and in Afghanistan interest, keeping a working relationship with Pakistan is so important. And I have to get back to that time when Afghanistan, the, the, the government of Afghanistan could take that decision. And despite everything, despite all the differences, they knew that the revival of Pakistan was so much in their interest that they took our side during our wars against India because of a number of reasons. Pakistan is so important for them. Pakistan used to provide, you know, so many uh, avenues for the Afghans. And come on, let's be frank. Afghans do not want a common border with India. And more importantly, the Indians also do not want to have a common border with Afghanistan. We are very happy that there is a country called Pakistan that is within. It can take, um, you know, any negative fallouts, can be blamed for whatever may not be working, but it provides that cushion. We are very happy to do that, so, because we know where our interests are. We are happy to be there, and all that we want is, regardless of what India does and India wants, if we can create that of an environment in Afghanistan that becomes independent of any foreign influence, Pakistan, India, United States, Russia, etc., etc., then the relationship will be like between two normal countries who will have their problem, but at the same time they know that they'll have to live with each. Thank you, General Durrani. Uh, Minister Mastur, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, at least uh, uh, on the second part of your question, both uh, Minister Dawzai and uh, Mr. Asad Durrani uh, touched, but on the first part of the question related to uh, uh, President-elect Biden uh, role and on peace and also in Afghanistan-Pakistan relation. Uh, first on peace, uh, though uh, it's still time between now and uh, January the 20th. Uh, so there is uh, a team in DC and uh, they are following uh, the policies. Uh, but uh, general expectation uh, in Afghanistan is that uh, President-elect Biden uh, will have his own view. Uh, he may give more uh, 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 time to the uh, 
military to give him uh, good advices, uh, at least what to do. But uh, some expectation is that he may give time to the military at least for one more year, uh, though there is a U.S.-Taliban uh, uh, agreement. But there are many violations by uh, the Taliban side as well. So uh, maybe uh, that one year will give everybody a good time uh, uh, on reaching uh, agreements because so far uh, the progress is very slow or too slow or not moving at all. Uh, and uh, this is not helpful to, uh, for anyone. But uh, uh, on the second part of the same question on Afghanistan-Pakistan relationship, I think Biden knows both Pakistan and Afghanistan very well. Uh, and uh, I think we've uh, heard him in several remarks about uh, Afghanistan and peace process. And I think U.S. Uh, came uh, to this view uh, that this is time uh, to build a better understanding between these two countries, which is good for the peace process. So overall, uh, uh, people are optimistic, uh, though I'm not sure that it is the same understanding on the Taliban side whether they uh, uh, preferred uh, uh, President Trump to win or uh, uh, Mr. Biden. But uh, we're optimistic about this uh, for our peace process. And uh, I'm sure that the peace uh, will have its uh, real positive impacts on both uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. And as I mentioned, uh, I repeatedly heard the same message uh, in uh, Pakistan that military solution uh, there is no military solution and there should be a political settlement. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, the economic benefits uh, for Afghan peace for Pakistan is uh, really big. Thank you, Minister Mister. Uh, Dr. Siddiqa, over to you. Well, a lot has been said so very quickly. Um, see, I believe that I don't think that Biden is going to reverse the position on, on withdrawing uh, withdraw in the U.S. will. The question is how far and how much. Um, I'm not too sure about timing of it. I think a lot will depend on who replaces uh, Zalmay Khalilzad or whether um, this government also has Zalmay Khalilzad, you know, to keep keep contributing and, and, and keep uh, speaking. He is he's a long experience of, of uh, peace negotiations. But the process is going to kind of uh, slow down a bit, which also means a bit more violence uh, than unfortunately what, um, you know, what Afghanistan has already suffered. Um, Taliban, for instance, and other militant groups will definitely want to kind of ensure, um, you know, try to send the message that they they can control more territory or that um, you know they they are they they are a power to to uh, deal with so there is a lot of symbolism uh, around violence which i fear will be there uh, and and needs to be taken more seriously um, biden will probably i mean as as it as it becomes very clear through his, his the articles that he's written uh, through some of the statements he's given, um, he would like to reduce numbers of you know physical presence, but more technology, uh, more intel, etc. So that's going to be it. But but the the fact is that America is going to be a player around, uh, you know, for 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 quite a considerable time. It's not withdrawing, withdrawing. It will withdraw, but not withdraw, withdraw. Um, now the question of uh, during line and 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 what Pakistan you know what what Pakistan wants what it you know what are the statements coming from from Islamabad what I would look at it more as I mean a lack of better expression it's stick and carrot um, Pakistan has been I mean the imagination of during line on both sides has been very different uh, for Afghanistan and and Afghan society it's critical. Uh, it's not a border, it's a frontier that the two countries have had, the two territories have had even before 1947. A frontier is essentially uh, the way I look at it, is different from a border border. Uh, and, and, and so there was freer movement. Uh, for Pakistan, it's important to secure this border, turn the frontier into a border, which it's done uh, in the form of, Durand, of fencing of the Durand line. But having done that, 
I think the message it's sending out through its prime minister is that, look, you can access it, you can go back and forth as long as A, you don't challenge it, and B, uh, there's a bit of a discomfort regarding Pakistan's domestic political situation. I mean, I'm referring to uh, the Pashtun Tahafuz movement and the suspicion that this may uh, someday get exploited by, uh, you know, by, by Pashtun nationalism on the other side. So that, you know, it's trying to cap those fears uh, by securing the border. Uh, yes, the intent of having, you see, I don't have any doubt that Pakistan wants good relations with, with Afghanistan. There shouldn't be any doubt about it. The question is, what kind of Afghanistan does it want? Uh, you know, there, there's a definition of, you know, of, of a client state and a client state. I mean, from a point when there was kind of uh, more, uh, kind of a much more excessive and, 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 and visible uh, effort to control Afghan politics to a more subtle way of, uh, of, of controlling Afghan politics to ensure that uh, it remains on Pakistan's side. And that has been consist consistently the policy since Geneva Accords of the 1980s. Uh, and, and I don't think that Pakistan has moved away from that an inch. It, it, it feels that ideologically, uh, the Taliban are much more reliable and dependable. And therefore, the makeup, the, the Kabul government that it wants is a government which it can rely on on, on more. And, and uh, fencing of Durand line and uh, signaling is, is part of it. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Siddiqua. This brings us uh, to the close of our session for today. Once again, I thank, uh, once again, I thank Minister Dawood Zai, Minister Mastur, Dr. Siddiqua, General Durrani for being with us today and sharing your insights and invoking a open and frank discussion. Um, and I'd also like to take this opportunity uh, to thank the Afghanistan Institute for Strategic Studies uh, for providing us with this platform to have this discussion today. And I'd like to congratulate them on holding the ninth session of the Herald Security Dialogue.